Our speaker tonight, Mark Zimmerman, uh, comes to us highly recommended. He comes to us from Rockford, our uh, way of Nashville. I got that. Nashville, from Rockford. Something like that. And I said, You're here. <laughs> anyway, uh, he's a retired newsman who has become an expert on the events uh, in Nashville and Middle Tennessee during the uh, Civil War. He's going to give us a program with slides and I assume pictures, which would be good for us, um, with detailing, uh, depending on which side you are on, either the retreat or the pursuit of what's left of the Army of Tennessee after Nashville in 1864. This is part of the Civil War in action that we rarely hear about. Matter of fact, I can't recall ever having a speaker on this topic. And since I've already taken up too much time up here, uh, Mark, why don't you come up? Um, uh, here, let's give Mark a great thing. Thank you very much. I'm happy and honored to be here. Just to clarify, I was born and raised in Rockford, little Chicago, Grady City at the top of Illinois, and I spent some time in uh, Wisconsin being a Packers fan. Still a oh. man. <laughs> uh, my slideshow uh, tonight is based on my book, uh, Mud, Blood, and Cold Steel, which I call a detailed overview of the convoluted mess. <laughs> the pursuit of John Bell Hood's Army of Tennessee after their route at Nashville by the Federals under George Henry Thomas. I think it's what was there. I could look at that. Okay. Working. I don't think the slideshow is on. I think it's good. Like a PowerPoint. Okay, should work it. There we go. Ah. All right. There's a little music here. Uh, the uh, presentation is uh, based on my book, uh, which is up here. Uh, this is uh, some of my contact information here, the website. Uh, the book is available at, uh, on any online bookstore in the print version or as an ebook. And I need to give a plug to my three other Civil War books. One's about gunboats, one's about uh, Civil War Nashville, and my latest one is Fortress Nashville, uh, which is a great big book. And uh, I'm honored that it was named one of the top 10 Civil War books of 2022 by uh, Civil War books and authors. Okay, the pursuit retreat, we always call it the retreat uh, in Nashville, uh, was a unique event of the Civil War, according to the late great Ed Bars. It was a full retreat and pursuit over 10 days and 100 miles of near constant combat through rough terrain and miserable winter weather. And I will be telling you uh, and proving to you that it was a brutal retreat. Edward Longacre, the biographer of U.S. Cavalry Commander James Harrison Wilson, said the pursuit was one of the most devastating in American history. Ross Massey, historian for the Battle of Nashville Trust, said no army in the war endured a more miserable and depressing episode than did the Army of Tennessee on this retreat. Federal Surgeon George E. Cooper said probably in no part of the war had men suffered more than in the month of December 1864. Uh, uh, speaking on the number of casualties during the retreat, uh, there's no real definite numbers, especially on the Confederate side, uh, but not 
relatively not very many uh, compared to something like Shiloh or Chickamauga or even Franklin. Uh, Battle of Nashville, two days, there were 3,000 casualties, 300 killed. Uh, I think those, those figures should be a little bit bigger, but uh, on this retreat, uh, it's my contention that 5,000 to 10,000 horses and mules perished in the weather. Uh, going to give a little uh, overview of the uh, uh, retreat here. And I don't know if you can see that in the back, but we start up here at Nashville on the Cumberland River. We go down to Franklin and then uh, go down to uh, Columbia, which is on the uh, Duck River there. And then we go down to the next uh, town is Pulaski, which of course is the birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan. And then we, uh, that's where the turnpike, the paved turnpike ends at Pulaski as does the railroad. Uh, railroad keeps going this way. Uh, the pursuit uh, turns southwesterly down into Alabama, down to the Tennessee River at Bainbridge here uh, over a span of 10 days. Army of Tennessee historian Stanley Horn, who wrote one of the books raffled tonight, on the aftermath of the Battle of Nashville, he puts it very well. He says, the next 10 days was a nightmare of nerve-wracking hardship and struggle for both armies, alternating marching and fighting, worn down by battle fatigue and sheer physical exhaustion, they somehow managed to carry on an almost continuous running battle from Nashville to the Tennessee River. The weather was abominable, rain, sleet, and snow with below freezing temperatures. Wagons and guns churned roads into seemingly bottomless quagmires, which froze into sharp-edged ruts during the cold night. Heavy rains not only drenched the suffering soldiers, but soon flooded the streams and made passage of each one of them a serious problem. Uh, the retreat uh, began, of course, at Compton's Hill in Nashville, now known as Shy's Hill, on February, December 16th. Uh, units of Hood's army organized to establish a holding action, which allowed much of the infantry to escape uh, through Brentwood and surge southward to the uh, village of Franklin. Fighting was uh, fierce on December 17th with hand-to-hand -hand combat north of Franklin and a major confrontation at a tributary of the West Harvest River. Uh, as we're talking here, I'm gonna show you, uh, here's the West Harvest River and the bigger Harpeth River here at Franklin. And these uh, show the major incidents, battles, skirmishes. Uh, during the retreat, you can see the number of waterways and rivers that had to be uh, crossed, um, boarded, or with, uh, as Bart would say, potting bridges. <laughs> uh, and of course, this, uh, this map is laid uh, Sideways, uh, we're going from north to south, left to right. Okay. Band of the Confederate rear guard changed hands several times in the first few days as the federal troopers, armed with repeating rifles, tried to outflank them on the turnpike. Use of the paved turnpike, which ran from Nashville to Franklin to Columbia to Pulaski, was vital to both sides. Many rivers and streams had to be crossed. Destroyed bridges had to be replaced. Rainy conditions turned the small creeks into raging torrents. Uh, there was much skirmishing along Rutherford Creek, which was difficult to cross. The arrival of the federal Ponton train was delayed due to critical errors. Then the weather turned bitterly cold with snowfall. The Duck River at Columbia was a major obstacle, as was the arrival of Confederate Major General Nathan Bedford Force. He employed delaying tactics to hasten the retreat while battling his coordinators all the way through Pulaski to the state line. Major conflicts were fought at Linville and Richland Creek, north of Pulaski, and at Anthony's Hill and Sugar Creek, south of that town. By that time, Confederate troops were slowly crossing the Tennessee River to safety, on a rickety mountain bridge as last chance fighting evolved into a pure cavalry event. Uh, I'm talking real quickly here because we got a lot of ground to cover and I want to try and cover most everything tonight. Uh, orders of battle and commanders, uh, the Federal Vanguard, uh, the infantry was led by Thomas J. Wood of the 4th Corps. 
The cavalry was led by uh, James Harrison, Terry Wilson, uh, one of the boy wonders of the Civil War. Uh, he was a native of Shawneetown, Illinois, on the Ohio River. 1860 graduate of West Point. He was a topo engineer on the Vicksburg campaign and became a very close friend of U.S. Grant, the only officer on Grant's staff to receive a, uh, a combat command. command. Uh, here are his four divisions of cavalry, one uh, consisting of just of one brigade, Proxton. Uh, uh, Hatch's uh, division had uh, Stewart and uh, Davis Poon. Sixth Division of Richard Johnson had uh, Colonel Harrison and uh, Colonel Biddle. Uh, and uh, the Seventh Division under Knight had uh, uh, General Hammond and uh, uh, Gilbert Johnson. And as you can notice, there are many Illinois regiments uh, amongst these uh, commands. Uh, I should note that uh, Biddle's brigade was, was unmounted. <laughs> Uh, here's just pictures of the uh, commanders, federal commanders, uh, most of them favoring facial hair. As you can see. <laughs> Spencer repeating carbine, uh, 52 caliber brass rim fire, 22 inch long barrel. Uh, operating the carbine, you lowered the trigger guard, which ejected the spent shell, and you raised it back up, which uh, put a new shell into the chamber, you manually cocked it aimed it, fired it, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Uh, had a spring-loaded uh, tubular magazine holding seven shots, which went up to the bucks, uh, to the buckle dot, and you could carry spare uh, magazines in the Blake sleeve cartridge box, which could carry 10 to 12 uh, uh, magazines. Here's a picture of federal troopers firing their Spencers. Uh, from a prone position in front, uh, the uh, soldier behind him is reloading the magazine. Hopefully the muzzle is not buried in the dirt. Uh, the man behind him is firing from a crouching position. And then, of course, the commanding officer with the uh, cap and ball pistols in his belt. Uh, Wilson was, a comp was competent and dutiful but also arrogant, highly ambitious, impatient, outspoken, a glory hunter of the first magnitude, and a stranger to humility and self-doubt. <laughs> uh, in 1864, he uh, reorganized the Federal Cavalry Bureau and ordered uh, Spencer repeating Harvey. With the Spencer, he said a regiment could be mistaken for a brigade. I have never seen anything else like the competent inspired by it in regiments or brigades which have it. Uh, here's a counterfactual. Jim Kay, who is the former president of the Battle of National Trust, he lives on the battlefield. He is a very uh, avid relic hunter. One of the rooms in his house is a virtual museum. He says it's a big misconception that Wilson's troopers all had Spencer's. The relics don't support that, although research is incomplete. He said he's found more Maynard and Bernstein cartridges than Spencer's, and that some of the federal infantry were using Spencer's. And that Sharp's uh, cartridges begin to show up at the Battle of the Barricade, which we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, before the Battle of Nashville, Wilson uh, had a major uh, shortage of horsepower. Uh, he said that within seven days, 7,000 horses were obtained in Middle Tennessee and Western Kentucky. Every horse and mare that could be used was taken. All streetcar livery stable horses and private carriage and saddle horses were seized. Even Andrew Johnson, the vice president-elect, was forced to give up his pair. A clean sweep was made of every animal that could carry a cavalryman. And for that, uh, Johnson called Wilson a bumptious puppy. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make here is that Wilson's uh, mounts may not be of the best stock or, or, or the best frame of horse. Uh, the Confederate rear guard uh, changed hands at that time. First few days, Stephen uh, Dill Lee, no relation to Robert E. Lee, uh, was a corps commander, uh, very young, very capable. Uh, he uh, 
formed the rear guard right after the Battle of Nashville and the Franklin fight. Uh, he was wounded uh, at, in Franklin, and Carter Stevenson took over command uh, at that time. And then north of Columbia, uh, Benjamin Franklin Cheatham, war commander, uh, took over his infantry, took over the rear guard duties. Uh, from Columbia South, uh, Forrest was in charge of the rear guard. Uh, Walthall uh, was in charge of the infantry rear guard. And Alexander P. Stewart was up there. He's a corps commander uh, because some men said that he was actually more in charge during the retreat than, than Hood was. Uh, this is a breakdown of Forrest Command. Chalmers' division was at Nashville. Uh, Buford's and Jackson's were with Forrest at Murfreesboro during the Battle of Nashville. Um, Rutgers Command and uh, Chalmers. Uh, very hard hitting unit. Uh, Buford, uh, Kentuckian, uh, weighing over 300 pounds, very nimble, uh, very good uh, equestrian and uh, judge of horse flesh. Uh, here was wounded three times during uh, sorry, three times during the campaign. So Buford basically took over the command of the Kentucky. Yeah, Irish Bell from Tennessee was actually older than Buford was in Tennessee. Uh, Ray Jackson's uh, division consisted of Frank Armstrong's Mississippians and uh, Sullivan Ross's Texans. Uh, Frank Armstrong was uh, interesting in that he fought for the Union in the first battle of Bull Run and then changed his mind and fought the rest of the war. And in charge of the artillery uh, battalion was Captain uh, John Morton, very capable, 22 years old. Uh, that's a complete competent force. Is this is here's uh, pictures of the Confederate commanders. It's not a spot. Spring cheese for Nikki. What else? Shut up. Watch your date. Briefly, uh, Hood uh, turned north after the surrender of Atlanta. And they invaded uh, Tennessee from northern Alabama, crossing the Tennessee River northward. Uh, Stein Sherman is uh, going the other direction in the march to the sea, down to the bank. Here's the schematic of the uh, uh, skirmishes on Hood's um, northward, northward uh, campaign up towards uh, uh, Nashville, which includes, of course, uh, Spring Hill. And the uh, debacle at Franklin, where his army was severely wounded. Battle of Nashville. Uh, here we're showing uh, Nashville up here, uh, the inner and outer uh, federal defense works. Fort Angley is right here. Uh, the Confederates came up and put their line right here. Uh, all I'm going to say about the first day is that the Federals hit them on both sides and pushed them back to the second line here. This is the Franklin fight. This, I'm sorry, this is the Granny White fight. This is the Franklin fight. This is the National Indicator Railroad. This is Compton's Hill or Shy's Hill. The line has refused a little bit there. Um, and here is Peach Orchard Hill over here. The Federals attacked Hood's army on Thursday, December the 15th, forcing them back two miles into a shorter line. Following three p.m. attacks on Peach Orchard Hill, Pat Thomas rode to the west flank and consulted with Schofield and Wilson. With a low growl, he advised them the battle must be fought, even if men are killed. Then they noticed Brigadier General John MacArthur of Chicago, Illinois, uh, native Scotsman, Moving against the hill, Thomas told Schofield, General MacArthur is attacking without waiting for you. Please advance your entire line. By the time Wilson got back to his own men, uh, the route was on. This is Compton's Hill, Shy's Hill, and uh, uh, Wilson's troopers were down here blocking the Granny White Pike. Uh, so instead of going straight south, uh, they had to go uh, southeastward towards uh, the Franklin Pike. Uh, MacArthur uh, took the hill up here, and it is said that uh, Finley's 
Floridians were the first ones to throw down the rifle for fun. And the route uh, became like dominoes along the Confederate line. Uh, this is a famous picture of the Battle of Nashville. These are Minnesota troops going up Shies Hill. Uh, Howard Pyle painting hangs in the state house in uh, St. Paul, also hangs above my bed. <laughs> And the next slide is going to show you a panoramic view of Compton's Hill, which was nominally had, uh, held by a division of Bates uh, troops. Uh, there were far fewer trees at the time of the battle. The Confederate line was placed too high uh, at the geographic crest instead of the military crest because they placed it there at nighttime. Not a very large place for a division. Uh, it's a lot flatter now than it was at the time of the war. Uh, all of the units in the Confederate Army were, were vastly under strain. At this time, mostly due to the L.O. Franklin. 114th Illinois uh, just put a monument up on uh, Chise Hill. And uh, you can see it, uh, see it here. This is a trail that winds up up Chise Hill, which is very steep. And down here, I can barely see it, and you probably can, is the Minnesota line out there. Okay, this is a topo map showing uh, the action here. Um, I just kind of covered up a little bit there, but Chai's Hill is about up here, and these are the Overton Hills. Not very high, but very steep and heavily wooded. And there's a little gorge that runs through here, but most of the troops got down to the Franklin Pike. S.D. Lee, who was up here, uh, was not heavily engaged at Franklin or Nashville. And so his troops fell back uh, down to this area and formed a rear guard, allowing the Confederate troops to uh, flow on down uh, the pike to uh, Brentwood Station. And of course, nightfall was, uh, was falling also. Battle of Barricade. Not Reaching the Granny White Pike via a narrow farm lane, Rucker united with D.C. Kelly's men. Rucker's brigade, totaling 1,200 men, constructed a stout brigade of logs, brush, and fence rails across the roadway, three and a quarter miles south of Compton's Hill, almost due west of the Brickland Rail Station. Also manning the structure was the 7th Alabama, which included a company of cadets from the University of Tuscaloosa. One of the fiercest conflicts that ever took place in the Civil War, according to Wilson, who said his foe fought with uncommon fierceness, a scene of pandemonium in which flashing carbines, whistling bullets, bursting shells, and the imprecations of struggling men filled the air. Above the din, while men fired their weapons at muzzle flashers, Kelly extorted, pour it into them, boys, pour it into them. I'm not even able to advance it by hand. Yeah. So I'm trying, but it's not even doing that. And what should happen and what does happen are two different things. Uh, Rutger engaged Spalding, George Spalding of the 12th Tennessee. Ironically, uh, Rutger was of the 12th Tennessee Confederate in a celebrated saber duel in which they exchanged sabers somehow. Uh, Rutger was shot, disabled, and captured and spent the night at Wilson's headquarters where he convinced them that Forrest was in the vicinity. Uh, the next day, Rutger's arm was amputated. Uh, he was out of the picture early. 
Wilson was chomping at the bit to get started in his quest to bag Hood's army. This late in the year, the sun rose at 7 a.m. and only gave about nine hours of daylight. Steady rainfall was turning all the terrain off the turnpike into a muddy quagmire. The rebels, of course, were destroying the bridges after crossing them. There we go. Yeah. Can you get it by remote? I just did it by hand. Yeah. Okay. I think so. Okay. This is a, a statue or a, a, of, of the, uh, the saber duel. Uh, Rutgers, the man facing it there. You can see the federal spalding is has his carving there at his side, but that's not a Spencer carving. Probably a Smith, I guess. But, but yeah. Of course, Pat Thomas came down there and said, dang it, the hell, Wilson, didn't I tell you we could lick him? Okay, next we're going to be talking about this area here down around the Franklin area and the Harpeth River. Uh, this is the terrain from Brentwood Station down the Franklin Road to Franklin. Uh, there's Carton and the Carter House, and then this becomes the Columbia Pike. And there's the Carter Creek Pike and the Lewisburg Pike. And here's here's the big Carpet River, and then here's the West Carpet River. And this is where the battle of the West Carpet takes place. Hollow Tree Gap. Uh, this is on the 17th at 9 a.m. at Hollow Tree Gap, sometimes called Holly Tree Gap. Two mounted federal regiments attempted to overpower the rear guard. While the 19th Pennsylvania drove down the pike, the 10th Indiana circled around the Confederate right flank and threatened to engulf them. The Federals initially were repulsed with the loss of 22 killed and wounded and 63 captured. But then the rear guard, worried that the Hoosiers might outflank them, fell backwards towards Franklin. The 10th Indiana Cavalry under Lieutenant Colonel Gresham captured two flags, two colonels, two lieutenant colonels, and 110 enlisted men, mostly from the 4th and 30th Louisiana. Uh, historian Nathan Hughes uh, wrote about Hollow Tree Gap. This small cavalry rearguard action marked the beginning of a systematic effective deployment of cavalry as a defensive screen for Hood's retreating army. The federal cavalry from this day forward would exercise far more caution in their pursuit, worrying about rushing into an ambush as they attempted to bring Hood's army to bay. Captain Obadiah Hayden of the 9th Indiana Cavalry said the guns and other equipment strewn along the road, the apparent abandonment of everything that impeded their flight, every door guard filled with ill-clad shivering prisoners had led us to the conclusion that we had a walkover. Hollow Tree Gap undeceived us. Uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, Randy Station. Perhaps the largest cavalry engagement on American soil took place along Franklin Pike and the Nashville and Decatur Railroad, sweeping across what is now the Harlingsdale Farm. Now, it, it is acknowledged that the Battle of Randy Station uh, was the largest cavalry battle of the war with 18,456 horsemen involved. What was it? <laughs> at 10.30 a.m. At 10.30 a.m., Wilson's cavalry of 3,000 men crashed into the Confederate earthworks just north of the Harpeth River. Vastly outnumbered Gibson's men and sporting cavalry fought as long as they could before being nearly surrounded. They then fled over the Ponton Bridge having lost 13 killed, 25 wounded, and 364 captured. Uh, hampering the Federals was the fact that the Confederates had wrapped wire around tree stumps, uh, which is very effective against horses. Wilson said it was killing work for both sides. The rain was still pouring in fields on both sides of the road soaking wet. The pursuit raged through the village of Franklin. What men found there was unnerving and disheartening. The site of fierce fight, fighting two weeks earlier, the town sheltered more than 2,000 wounded, including 250 Federals and 45 makeshift hospitals. 
Uh, here's just a little map of Franklin, the Harvest River. This is the Confederate uh, earthworks we're talking about. Here's the uh, bridge, uh, the railroad where we passed through to there. This is Fort Granger, which was not uh, uh, occupied during this part of the retreat. The Harpeth River at Franklin was a formidable obstacle uh, for the Federals. Wilson's Fourth Corps of Infantry moving down the main pipe was delayed for 18 hours at the Harpeth. It was becoming apparent to Federal infantry that the best of their pioneers were away with Sherman in Georgia. The Federal pontoon train was desperately needed at the Harpeth River, but where was it? General Thomas, groggy from sleep, perhaps a little whiskey, had ordered had ordered the pontoon train down the Murfreesboro pipe instead of the Franklin pipe, uh, and he insisted on that. And uh, they got some miles down the pipe until everybody said, "Where are we going? There's nothing down here." So. Uh, the commander of the train tried to uh, make up some time by taking a shortcut, which made it even worse. They got uh, mired in the mud, and, you know, this train was miles long, trying to reverse it, had to go back to Nashville, and back down the pipe, which was, was full of all kinds of uh, soldiers. Um, at 1.30 p.m., just south of Franklin, uh, here's a picture uh, at Fredericksburg, but this shows federal engineers building a hot bridge under fire. Um, at 1.30 p.m., just south of Franklin, uh, Wilson reorganized his troopers. Johnson's division would move along the federal right flank down the Carter Street Pike to the west. Hatch and Knight would pursue, uh, pursue directly down what was now the Columbia Pike to two parallel columns. Proxton's brigade would advance eastward along the Lewisburg Pike and eventually halt for the night at Douglas Church. Along the way, Proxton would capture 130 more <laughs> prisoners. Battle at the West Harpeth River. This is towards nighttime on December 17th. <laughs> Federal cavalry pushed boldly through Franklin, constantly harassing the rear guard until they met Clayton's men at Winstead Hill. S.D. Lee was wounded in the foot. Carter Stevenson took over. Then the Confederates and Stevenson's division halted about three miles south of Franklin and made a stand at the West Harpeth River. This is from the O.R. Atlas. You can see uh, Stevenson's infantry there. What you can't really see is that they are on the backside of a gentle slope which is crest about here, so the Federals did not see them until they were right on them. These statues are all from the Grand Statue in front of the U.S. Down the turnpike came the Federal troopers, uh, Knight attacking in front while Hatch worked the Confederate right flank and Johnson the left flank. Hatch was forced to delay his attack as some Federals got mixed in with Confederate stragglers. The Confederates moved their artillery into position during this delay. Wilson then ordered Hatch and Knight to form ranks and charge. He directed his escort of 180 men, the 4th U.S. Cavalry, commanded by Lieutenant Joseph Hedges, to form in columns of four and charge straight down the pike. Hedges moved off the pike to allow the Chicago Board of Trade Artillery Battery to return fire. Hedges crashed his fourth U.S. regulars into the rebel line, sabers drawn and slashing. Douglas's battery opened up with deadly canister, throwing the Federals backward and leaving their commander stranded. Hedges waved his hat and yelled, The Yankees are coming, run for your lives! The crews worked and Hedges escaped. Stevenson was forced back and crossed the stream, fighting every inch of the way. Along the way, the infantry formed into a three-sided hollow square. Finally, with darkness at hand, he briefly halted to reorganize his line, only to be struck again by hatch. In the darkness, men could not discern friend or foe, and units mingled. Uh, for fierceness, the skirmishing exceeded any his regiment had ever engaged in wrote a veteran sergeant of the 2nd Iowa Cavalry. Uh, one Confederate cavalryman described the brutality 
The enemy's cavalry swooped down upon us with drawn sabers, cutting and slashing us from right to left. Three soldiers assaulted General Buford at one time. One he shot, another he struck over the head with the butt of his pistol, and the third he grabbed by the hair and pulled from his saddle and thus escaped. They swarmed all around me like a flock of blackbirds. How I got out with the whole skin, I do not know. My face was powder burned and my hair was scorched from the pistol shot thrust in my face at the moment of discharge, and I found myself with two severe bruises on my shoulder from saber strokes. Exhausted but winded, uh, Wilson was forced to call off the pursuit due to exhaustion and darkness. He exclaimed, Hatch is a brick. If only it had been light, we certainly would have destroyed their entire rear guard. As it was, they were severely punished. Wilson said West Harpeth was another running night fight in which all semblance of order was lost. The regiment got separated from regiment, troop from troop, officers to men. There was no guide but the turnpike. Now, on the retreat, a couple of things that are unique are the number of uh, night uh, affairs, which is very unusual during the Civil War, and also the fact that the cavalry used their sabers a lot. It's hardly hardly ever done, but there was a lot of hand-to-hand -hand fighting uh, on this retreat. Okay. This shows the uh, Franklin is up here. Here's Spring Hill. Here's Ferguson Hall where uh, Van Dorn got one back of the head. Uh, Ripavilla where Hood had his breakfast before uh, Franklin. Anyway, this is Columbia Pike, Rutherford Creek, uh, Carter's Creek, Bear Creek, whole bunch of creeks in here uh, that had to be crossed. Down here is the Duck River, Sizable River, then there's Columbia, and then what becomes the Lasky Pike. Just a picture of uh, Columbia showing the river. Uh, Forrest arrives at Columbia. Well, before we get into that, at 1 p.m. on the 18th, there was a significant development. Wilson called a temporary halt to the pursuit seven miles north of Columbia, would not pursue uh, operations of full measure for several days. Cavalry, uh, Federal cavalry went into camp. The spring finally wound out of its coil. Wilson knew that Hood's men were crossing the Duck River on bridges. The Federal Ponton Bridge had yet to be delivered, PA unknown. Wilson's troopers had now been fighting for three straight days. They were flat out tired and their horses worn out. Uh, Biddles and Gilbert Johnson's brigades were sent back to Nashville to be replenished and never got back into the fight. Horses require a lot of feed. Horses are eating machines, according to one expert. Quartermaster regs call for 26 pounds of food per day per horse and 23 pounds per mule consisting of 14 pounds of hay and 12 pounds of grain, usually oats, corn, or barley. Roughly 180 wagons were needed daily to feed Wilson's horses. It's difficult to imagine how Wilson's cavalry and wood infantry could be supplied on a daily basis by wagon trains, all using the same main road. Now, as Cheatham's Corps Prepared to cross the Duck River Bridge, Forrest and his men arrived with the same intention. Forrest asserted his right to cross first. Imagine that. Cheatham replied, I think not, sir, you are mistaken. I intend to cross now and will thank you to move out of the way of my troop. Forrest drew his pistol and rode over to Cheatham and said, If you are a better man than I am, General Cheatham, your troops can cross ahead of my troops. Cheatham reportedly replied, shoot, I am not afraid of any man in the Confederacy. And about this time, all the soldiers were raising their guns up, getting ready to do each other in. General Lee stepped in to mediate and convinced them to apologize. It's not known for certain which group crossed first, although one report asserts that Lee sent force to cross first and then pacified Cheatham. Uh, by the morning of Tuesday, December the 20th, sleep had turned to snow as Hood and the main portion of his army left Columbia, having put Forrest in charge of the rear guard with orders to pull the Duck River line as long as possible. Now, Forrest had just arrived from Murfreesboro to Columbia. 
Uh, the next destination down the turnpike was the small town of Pulaski, uh, named for the founder of American Cavalry, Casimir Pulaski, 28 miles to the south, where the paved turnpike came to an end. South of Columbia, the rolling countryside turned into a much more hilly and barren terrain. Narrow defiles through the hills would restrict movement along the plain and provide ample opportunities for setting up an ambush. Uh, the march of the Army of Tennessee miles in length was resumed on the Pulaski Pike with S.D. Lee's corps in front, commanded by Stevenson, Cheatham's corps next, and A.P. Stewart's corps bringing up the rear. Uh, Walthall was put in charge of the rear guard infantry. The force now had about 2,000 effective infantry including 400 men without shoes and 3,000 cavalry to face a pursuing federal force of more than 10,000 cavalry armed with repeating rifles and perhaps up to 30,000 infantry. By the nightfall of the 20th, Woods' federal infantry rested on the north bank of the Duck River opposite Columbia, waiting for the pontoon train to arrive. Uh, Wilson's cavalry remained in bivouac waiting for supplies while Hatch's men scared across the river at Columbia, where forces, uh, Forrest's cavalry and Walpole's infantry lingered. Forrest persuaded Hatch to stop shelling the town. Uh, in other news, on December 21st, Sherman's march to the sea ended as his troops entered Savannah on the east coast. Sherman had led 62,000 troops 285 miles across Georgia and cut a path of destruction more than 50 miles long. You can see here that uh, the uh, eight brigades holding almost 2,000 riflemen were uh, reformed into four uh, brigades under Featherston, Reynolds, Field, and Palmer. Uh, this was 2,000 men, nominally more than 30 regiments, so you can see how depleted the Confederates were. This is just a picture of a Confederate uh, cavalry reenactor, uh, usually riding his own horse and usually using weapons and supplies captured from the Federals. Uh, and their uniforms were anything but uniform. Uh, here's just the organization of the rear guard of the forest, Walthall Infantry, Support and Artillery. And uh, actually, five units of cavalry now Chalmers, Bell and Buford, Armstrong, and Hahn. Uh, this is the uh, this is the train uh, from uh, Columbia to Pulaski, 28 miles. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was a conflict here at Warfield Plantation and at Lindville. Uh, and at uh, Buford Station and Richland Creek, which uh, crosses the turnpike below in 11 below Plasky. And Buford Station is not named for Buford. Uh, this is the area we're talking about now on up to the tree, the last of the turnpike. On December 23rd, it took Wilson's cavalry, resupplied and rested the entire day to cross the Duck River, Woods' fourth corps having already crossed. Tired of waiting for the troopers, Woods began to march south at 2.30 p.m. and 90 minutes later, his infantry confronted forest pickets at the Warfield Plantation site and drove them further south with a volley of artillery fire. Uh, this happened again five miles south of Columbia. These were just delaying action uh, by force. Uh, by early dawn, Saturday, December 24th, the last of the Federal Army reached Columbia on the south bank of the Duck River. Uh, the Ponton train had finally arrived. Uh, by 7 a.m., Wilson's cavalrymen began trotting past Woods' infantry at the turnpike, assuming the lead. At noon, at long last, the Federal pursuit began again in earnest. Uh, it would be a day of constant skirmishing accentuated by periods of heavy fighting. At Richland Creek, uh, there's the schematic at Richland Creek, Dave Buford was severely wounded uh, and forced order to retreat when Croxton's and Hammond's brigades flanked Chalmers' line. 
force continued all the way to Pulaski, and though Wilson pursued, he did not catch up that night. From Richland Creek to Pulaski, the fighting was mostly hand-to-hand. -hand. Tyree Bell was put in command, but he didn't know where the uh, Kentucky troops were. Uh, he finally did locate them, ordered them across the creek. They were the last to cross before the bridge was demolished, leaving Bell in part of his escort on the north side. An artillery burst knocked Bell from his horse and blinded him in one eye permanently as it turned out. Chalmers was also there on the north bank with some of his men. They all fled for their lives, trying to hide amongst the hills. One federal cavalryman nearly reached Chalmers with a saber before he was shot down. They rode to the top of the hill, turned and volleyed into their pursuers, staggering them. They went down the hill, up another, and did the same thing. They raced across the cornfield to the creek bottom, and for some reason, the Federals did not contest their movement. They swam their horses to the south bank of the creek and greeted Forrest and Walpole. After nightfall, Forrest reached Pulaski without further molestation. Now, further on down the road, uh, one of the men said, on we marched through ice and rain and snow, sleeping on the wet ground at night, many thousands barefooted and actually leaving prints of blood upon the ground. Enemy pressing us in the rear. When we left the pike at Blasky, we had an awful road, which was strewn with dead horses and mules, broken wagons, and worse than all, broken continents. How we counted them as we passed them, one, two, three, up to 15. Those were the continents needed to cross the Tennessee River to safety. There was no turnpike now, only country roads that wound through increasingly hilly terrain, perfect settings for an ambush. George Estes of the 14th Mississippi, jumping a little bit ahead, was at the Tennessee River. We could see a rickety pontoon bridge hastily and insecurely built. It was serpentine in shape, about 12 feet wide and half a mile long, covered from end to end with all kinds of beasts and wagons. A Yankee gunboat half a mile uh, downriver uh, was throwing bombshells trying to break the bridge, but the shoals prevented it from getting near enough to do any damage. The north end of the bridge had a promiscuous mass of humanity and animals, all trying to get on and over the bridge at the same time. Finally, my time came. I went forward in great fear that the cable would break and let us all go down into eternity together. But the Lord permitted us to reach the southern shore without loss of life. Now, retired general and author John Scales noted that Wilson had five strong brigades, three independent, and two brigades organized into a division under Hatch. During the three days when Wilson led the pursuit, he used a different independent brigade as his lead or point element each day thus rotating the unit exposed to the most danger. He kept Hatch's division back in the column as an integrated unit. So he had a massive force that could be protected. He could maneuver as a whole once initial contact was made. Well, this is a picture of Richland Creek. And this is the picture of the soggy uh, terrain uh, on either side of the creek. Uh, the ridge line there, the bottom picture is actually a lot closer to the appears in the photograph. This is the territory south of Pulaski, and they're turning southwestward now, down towards uh, Florence, Alabama, and uh, the, uh, the train is is uh, getting very miserable and the roads miserable. This is the area we're talking about here. This is the terrain. Uh, this is Pulaski up here. This is the main road. And this is where Anthony's Hill next to where uh, Very hard to outline somebody in a mountainous territory like that. Again, this is a picture of the miserable condition. And here's the organization I was talking about, Wilson, with the two uh, brigades under Hatch and the three independent brigades, approximately here's Anthony's Hill. Christmas Day, Forrest set up an ambush at Anthony's Hill with a road swerved around the prominence. He used it infantry, cavalry, and artillery. 
Morton's guns, three to six, depending on which report, were positioned on the brow of the hill where they commanded the line of fire straight up the road. Infantry under Featherstone and Palmer flanked guns on the hill, uh, protected by hastily built barricades and supported by dismounted cavalry. Reynolds and Field held back but a line in reserve. Palmer's now all, all commanding Buford's brigade was on the side road guarding the right flank. Armstrong was at the front on the left flank, the main road with rocks protecting the right flank. Walpole explained that so broken is the ground at that point, so densely wooded, that there was no difficulty in effectually concealing the troops. Harrison's troopers arrived at 1 p.m. to find several of Ross's horsemen fleeing in mock fright, trying to draw the Federals into the trap. Harrison was hesitant, but approached nonetheless because he thought the number of the enemy was small. He ordered his men to dismount and form in the line. As they reached a critical point, more so-called bold pubs were open with double canister, and the infantry charged down the slopes from both directions. The ambush worked perfectly. Harrison troopers broke and ran, losing about 150 men killed or wounded, according to Forrest's after action report. Approximately 40 Confederates were killed or wounded. Uh, this is just a picture of Confederate cavalry charging into uh, <clears throat> federal positions. Uh, the last major conflict was at Trigger Creek. On Monday, December 26th, there were two significant events. The completion of the bridge of 80 mountain boats across the Tennessee River and the ambush of Wilson's cavalry by Forrest at Trigger Creek, about 30 miles back. This was early in the morning and there was very dense fog at that time. Forrest men killed or wounded 150 federal troopers and captured a dozen. Reportedly, 400 federal horses were killed and 350 others captured. Cameron, the federal, said, a spirited action followed in which the second Tennessee, supported by the fourth, drove the enemy into his works. A Confederate charge was made in turn by two columns of infantry with cavalry in the center driving us back about 300 yards across the creek, where we rallied, drove them back into the works, <clears throat> holding the position until the afternoon when the 14th Ohio battery shelled the rear guard out of the log room. This is Forrest's version. On the morning of the 26th, the enemy commenced the dance of driving back General Ross's pickets. Owing to the dense fog, he could not see the temporary fortification which infantry had thrown up. Uh, the enemy there uh, for advanced to within 50 paces of these works when the volley was opened upon him, causing the wildest confusion. Two mounted regiments of Ross's brigade and Hector's and Granbury's brigades of infantry were ordered to charge upon the dis discomfited foe, which was done, producing a complete rout. The enemy was pursued for two miles, and it's a little bit more than 300 yards. But the enemy showing no disposition to give battle, my troops were ordered back. This is in Virginia, but it gives you a little bit of an idea of what the Pont Bridge across the Tennessee looked like. It was much, much longer. After covering the crossing of Cheatham's and Stevenson's Corps, uh, Stewart's Corps crossed the river on the, on the Pont Bridge all day on Tuesday, the 27th. The, uh, Bridge was bolts downstream in the swift current of the wide river. The infantry had to cross single file three paces apart. After dark, Forrest and his cavalry crossed, leaving only Walpole's rear guard on the north side of the river. <clears throat> on the 28th at 3 a.m., Walpole set into motion so as to reach the bridge at daylight. One brigade was a part at a time uh, from uh, Reynolds withdrew his command for patrol creek in time to reach the main line by daylight. Hector's brigade would be the last to cross in Bowman's 39th North Carolina, the last regiment, before engineers began dismantling the bridge. Walpole directed that 200 of his men assist the engineers. By the late morning of December 28th, the Army of Tennessee had crossed and the bridge was taken up. A private Stevenson said the passage of the river being affected, we could at last breathe free. Our long, dreary, shameful flight was done. We controlled the Army appeared to be in the hands of Lieutenant General A.P. Stewart. 
continued to be our real leader throughout the retreat and directed passage over the river. On December 29th, Thomas officially called an end to the pursuit. Uh, Hood's army was not destroyed, but just like Hood himself, his army had been severely disabled. Forrest was so appalled at the condition of his army, he wrote, the army of Tennessee was badly defeated. It is greatly demoralized. And to save it during the retreat from Nashville, I was compelled almost to sacrifice my command. On January 23, 1865, the Army of Tennessee, numbering 18,742 men, reached Tupelo, Mississippi. That same day, General Richard Taylor arrived to assume command, General Hood having submitted his letter of resignation to President Jefferson Davis 10 days earlier. Uh, now, very briefly, in March of 1865, Wilson would lead 13,500 troopers, all with repeating rifles on a uh, raid through Alabama and uh, Georgia. Uh, he would uh, defeat Forrest at Selma. Uh, he would uh, direct Croxton to burn down uh, uh, the University of Tuscaloosa in retribution for their cadets fighting at the Battle of the Barricade back on the 16th. And uh, they would also assist in uh, capturing uh, Jefferson Davis. Wilson, the boy general, died in 1925 in Wilmington, Wilmington, North Carolina, having outlived all but three other Civil War generals. I don't know who they are. It's ironic that George Henry Thomas, the rock of Chickamauga and the sledgehammer of Nashville, would make the single most critical mistake of the pursuit. Thomas never forgave himself for not having a mobile force ready to cut off Hood after the Battle of Nashville. His failure was a grave error of judgment, later told Trent, adding that Hood's army ought to have all been captured. However, Thomas never quite took personal responsibility for sending the federal quantum train down the wrong road. In conclusion, given their overwhelming numbers and firepower, the deep down condition of Hood's army, the Federals under Thomas and Wilson should have rather easily have bagged the entire rebel army and either annihilated them or shipped them off to Northern prisoner of war. The fact that neither one of these possibilities occurred is testament to Yankee overconfidence and floundering, the appalling winter weather, the rugged terrain, and last but not least, the tactics of the uh, Confederate rear guard. Uh, Here's the Franklin Turnpike today, very affluent entity now. Franklin, I wanted to show you this picture of Spring Hill. There's the original village of Spring Hill. There's the Saturn plant, GMC plant now. This is this is all growth. The town grew 96% in 10 years. And they're planning a $2.3 billion battery plant there. This is happening all over Middle Tennessee. So if we want to see it, you know, better get up there and break down there quickly. Suggested further reading. And I want to close with this. Only 13% of eighth grade students show proficiency in learning history, according to a recent survey. The lowest level ever recorded. The next worst proficiency category was civics. Not sure our republic can survive with citizens unconscious or uncaring about their own history. Oh, and come down and see us. We've gotten rid of this monstrosity. <laughs> Fine. Uh, it looks like Forrest was having some kind of procedure done. <laughs> anyway, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Questions that I can find in? Yes, sir. Uh, you said that uh, when the Confederate Army got to Tupelo at the end of all this, there were 18,000. How many were there uh, when the Battle of Nashville began? Uh, Approximately. Let me uh, double check. Yeah, 18,742. I didn't mention that the federal claimed it was 14,500. Uh, there were 23,000 uh, Confederates at Danville, not counting for us from two divisions at Berkeley. And 
way down at the end of the like so really not much of a fight uh well some of the guys involved might argue about that but uh it was it was fierce fighting but at nashville i think the uh outcome was was foregone especially after the battle of frank what else sure. Mark, what, what sites are preserved outside of National and Frank was up of your thought on the Greek site? Are there any spots that have been well preserved or are being preserved or not? I have to think a little bit. You know, of course, you can visit Columbia, you can visit Blasky, um, and, and there's historical markers all along the site, but not really. No, a lot of this is on private property. A lot of it is changed yeah. until some years And uh, you get down past Blasky, uh, towards the uh, Alabama line, you start listening for banjo. <laughs> 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 Yeah, he was asking uh, below that, but go and see Franklin. Uh, I would also urge anybody who has it to see Shiloh. Yeah. I was struck by your commentary about how Hood didn't seem to com command the army during the uh, retreat. Uh -huh. What do Hood's defenders and relatives say about Hood? Well, they dispute that, of course. Uh, but Wood wanted to hold the line at the Duck River, uh, and Governor uh, Harris uh, uh, wanted to persuade him to do that, but the court dissuaded him to do that. Uh, all back to the uh, I think, you know, I think Wood and Forrest knew that the game was over, basically. Uh, they were fighting for time. Uh, and, and one of my uh, one of my theories is that, you know, people ask, well, why did these Confederates fight so long, so hard? They knew they were going to lose, overnumbered, overpowered. And and number one is they had nothing to go back to. Number two, uh, they didn't want to abandon their fellow soldiers, the street the court and all that. But number three, because of, of, of fact and rumors, they were terrified of being taken prisoner and shipped up to Camp Douglas among the smugglers. They didn't think they survived the winter. This was during the winter. Did the logistical situation improve any? Because at Nashville, I know that they had a horrible time getting any supplies there. And that's probably a place where they could afford better than in the hills south of Duck River. So um, was there even a logistical chance of stopping at the Duck River? Uh, no, not really, no. Um, but just, you know, he wanted to save face. He wanted to do as much as he could possibly do. Maybe if he had taken Forrest's advice and Franklin and allowed him to get with the uh, right, the left flank of the uh, tree, there might, there might have been a fight at, uh, at Nashville. A lot of what ifs. Yeah. I, I think there's about 10 what ifs. And then the Confederates might have had it. I said, <laughs> Well, I, I, I keep telling people uh, down south, they always argue about which general lost the war. And I keep trying to tell them, I think the Yankees had something to do with it. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, how, how do I put this in? Whatever possessed these people to think that they had a chance to go up, you take Tennessee and cross over the mountains to get back to you. What? What? Well, what, what, what would possess them to think that? Desperate times call for desperate measures. Well, okay. What else would he do, really? Just give up? Um, as long as the army would be doing. Well, I think Cliff was hoping for a miracle. 
Uh, one thing he was hoping for uh, trans Mississippi troops to, uh, to you know, help him. That never materialized. Well, you know, well, you know, yeah. He, he thought that maybe Richard Taylor might not be well. Um, and of course, there's a whole big debate about whether Butch or the big foot in charge in third place. Well, you know, yeah. Get one leg and Got to have three men strap them into the saddle. Uh, anyway, trying to redeem some of this. Okay. Anyway, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. All right. So now I have a couple of things to do. Right? Good.